Thompson was a racer. He loved the challenge of going faster than anyone. And at one point, he held the world land speed record. He made a name for himself as a drag racer, a desert racer, and the tougher the terrain, the better he raced. Mickey Thompson was also an inventor, and one of his greatest and longest lasting inventions is stadium racing. For more than a decade now, the racing series that bears his name has been thrilling large crowds all over America. So tonight, we'll celebrate this lasting accomplishment with a look back at the great moments of the stadium series, and we invite you to join us for this special hour. Mickey Thompson, a decade of racing. Look at that. The Mormon Watt, Ray Haroon, the driver. First winner here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 75 miles an hour? Don't think it would win today. I don't think so. Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Brew. And I'm Marty Reed. And we are here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Racing Museum to celebrate one thing, a decade of racing with Mickey Thompson. And there's a reason that we're here. There's a connection between the two. If you look back through the record books in off-road racing, you'll see the names of Rick Mears, Tom Sneva, and Robbie Gordon. And through the miracle of videotape, we'll relive some of the great racing memories not only they, but others have given us on the Mickey Thompson mm. circuit. How about Ivan Stewart oh. and Walker Evans? They've been banging on each other for 10 years. And if you remember the ESPN Speed World Open you just saw a few moments ago, that young motorcyclist flying off 60 feet down at the L.A. Coliseum, well, that happened right here on the Mickey Thompson Stadium Off-Road Racing Series, and we'll tell you about it tonight. That and more, as tonight, from Indianapolis, we celebrate Mickey Thompson, a decade of racing. To the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame and Racing Museum, where we continue the Mickey Thompson Decade of Racing Special. You know, Marty, when you enter racing, it doesn't matter how old you are, when you went through one particular level, you're a rookie. Uh, Jim Clark, a perfect example. In 1963, he came to the Speedway in this very Lotus and won Rookie of the Year honors. Two years later, he won the whole thing. This is your guy. Oh, when I was, a kid, this growing guy. Up, oh, when I was a kid growing up, this was the guy. You know, the other thing I think that's neat about the Mickey Thompson group is just because you start at one level doesn't mean that you're destined for that level forevermore. You can progress up and up and up, even into Grand National Sport Trucks. Well, perfect example is Rick Johnson won several Supercross championships, now making the jump into four-wheel action with Nelson and Nelson Racing. In 1992, he was a rookie, and he had some growing pains. Let's go back to Dallas, 1992. And we're going to show you what happened as far as the cause of the restart. Here comes Rick into the corner, gets up onto two wheels. Well, watch the bite. You'll get too much side bite right there. He clips the hydro barrier and rolls it over. Now, that jams everybody up behind them. All right, here they are on that far. This is the speed section of the course. The double jump, it's pedal to the metal here. Now we're going to watch again as they set up, see if Ricky Johnson swings too wide and if Walker Evans can find room to hit it. He is a little bit wide. Here it comes. If Walker can get down the inside, no, cannot do it. Almost so, because Ricky goes a little wide down the front straightaway. One lap to go. Marty, this could be one of the biggest wins so far of the year. A man that is a celebrated motocross racer has had a great career on two wheels, switched over to four this year hasn't it figured in any race so far this season and he's got this chevy thunder truck working to perfection this is tremendous for john nelson and the entire team if he can just make it thick he goes a little wide oh i think he may oh no this could have been the mistake uh oh there it is walker evans with every opportunity they are panel to panel he steps in and says ricky you need to learn a little oh no Walker Evans is spinning with head to side to side. Ricky Johnson has the lead, but we're going to obviously want to have a look at rough driving. Well, Walker Evans wins the race because just like Robbie Gordon did to Walker back in 1988 in Pasadena, take a look at this. Robbie Gordon pushed Walker across for the win, and Ricky Johnson will do the same. Take a look there. See, Walker crosses the line first. It doesn't matter what direction you're heading. Walker Evans back in the pits after the second heat race. How are you and how's the truck? 
Well, I think the truck's a lot worse off than I am. Believe me, I feel pretty good. Uh, uh, it's the first time in my whole life, or you might say career of racing, that I ever crossed the finish line looking at the checkered flag upside down through the window, though. This time, Rick Johnson's going to try the, the A lane, and he lets Millen go. This could be the race right here. If it works, and he can reel some distance in, he may make it work. If it doesn't work, and it turns out to be the slow lane, he could be so far back with only two laps to go, race could be over. He had no choice but to finally make a move, Marty, and it is not going to pay off for him. Ricky Johnson will still come out in second place, although he I don't did know. pick up. Oh, my goodness, look at him. He took the double jump in a single bound. Yeah, I mean, he got more acceleration coming off the corner. Now, he may try the same move again. Now, if you're Rod Millen, do you play a mind game with him and you just take the A-lane? Here comes Ricky on the inside. Wheel to wheel. What an awesome display of horsepower as the white flag comes out. There's some fender bending going on. Fiberglass flying everywhere. All right, now, Millen was forced to take the A-lane. He didn't want to. Final lap, Ricky Johnson on the inside. He said this, this 600 laps of practice showed him to do one thing. Get more aggressive. Had to get more aggressive. These guys, this is all out racing. Holy buckets of water. It comes down to this. Ricky Johnson in the Thunder car. And Millen seemed to have stalled in the corner. And Ricky Johnson will come out with the lead with a half a lap to go through the rhythm section. The double jumps. The far sweeping left-hand turns. Millen's not going to quit. He's got everything in that Toyota going right now, Marty. Johnson's got to stay to the inside. Don't give him the inside lane, Ricky. He's got him. Ricky Johnson. First ever win. And what a way to do it in front of the hometown fans here in Los Angeles, California. What a great move. Two world titles he won here on a motorcycle tonight. He brings home the main event and he stops the streak of Toyota. Ken, it seems like the job of breaking in the rookies has always fallen on Walker Evans' shoulders. Go back to 1989, Robbie Gordon was driving in his first year for Team Toyota. He and Walker got together at Pasadena at the Rose Bowl, and again, for the first time in his career, second actually, he ends up going over the finish line sideways with the aid of a rookie pushing him. Awfully rough driving. That's why they call him the legend. You know, we did a, a feature on rough driving a couple of years ago. It's a very tough job. It very is. unforgiving job. And thankless. Absolutely. And I think one of the best uh, examples was the Robbie Gordon Walker Evans set to. Let's take a look at this. High above the track here at Sun Devil Stadium sits a room that they call the Rough Driving Committee. Now in hockey, they've got the penalty box. In the NFL, they use instant replay. On the Mickey Thompson circuit, they call it rough driving, and these guys govern what goes on on the track below. Steve, I want to take you back to a point in time. This was the Seattle Kingdom, 1989. We're going to see some contact coming up here as they make a hard left-hand turn. That's Robbie Gordon, who pitches over Walker Evans. So you sitting up high above the Kingdom that night. What were you looking at and what happened? Well, what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, truck number six come into the turn. Then truck number 12 comes in behind him and center punches him right in the door and rolls him over. You can see his front wheels. He drove straight into vehicle number six and rolled him over. He made no attempt to avoid that situation. So Robbie was penalized that night at the Kingdom, I remember well. Same year, we're going to take you to the Rose Bowl 1989. This was one of the most bizarre finishes I ever have seen in off-road racing. That is Walker Evans in the lead. Robbie Gordon again will actually push him sideways across the finish line. And we went nuts the night this happened, but indeed it was an infraction. Steve, look back at it again and what went wrong with this one? Well, what we've got is they come into the corner there and truck number 12 gets up on top of number 6 and then just continues to stay there and push him. If you look, you see his wheels are still turned into truck number 6. The rear wheels are spinning, indicating that he's just standing on the gas pedal and making no effort at all to get away from truck number 6. What's interesting, if you notice, Steve refers to them by number, not by name. I guess he cares not about the personality behind it, just the trucks involved. Well, stay with us because Mickey Thompson, a decade of racing, will continue in just a moment. For more Mickey Thompson racing action. How about this horsepower here, huh? Can you imagine if you had this in your car? Ooh, better yet, let's put it on a motorcycle. No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, and that brings us to a good point, Marty. Of, of all the races that we've covered over the years with Mickey Thompson, very few have received the attention that this next one did. Well, back in 1990 at the Coliseum, we talked about at the beginning of the show, when you see the ESPN Speed World Open and you see that motorcycle rider flying off 60 feet down the peristyles at the Coliseum, well, that was Larry Brooks. And the story behind it of how he finished the race is as amazing as the crash itself. Now watch Brooks come over this jump. Watch him come over this jump right here. Oh! He ate him alive. He had him for lunch.
that you was a Lunchable. <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. You know, it's almost like ballet. Those, those, that's a classic footage that you always see of these slow motion guys. And at nighttime, there'd be flash bulbs going off like you wouldn't believe it here. Well, Coda Jarvie is holding on to the position so far, but I don't think it's a matter of if, but when he surrenders the lead to Mike Gregg. You know, I'll be honest Larry with Brooks. you, Marty. I mean, Coda Jarvie has really hung in there on this one. He's got two of the best racers, or the two best racers, chasing him down right now. And on board that Kawasaki, he is held tough. We've got a couple of riders down, Marty, on the far side of the course. I don't know if you can see him. There's the battle as the race continues. We'll keep you posted on what happens over there. You know, I like the fact that they use the double pair of style. It, it just opens up the excitement. Watch this, Marty. He's got some heat on his tailpipes, and Mike Craig has taken the lead. Brooks has run into second place, and Coda Jarvey has surrendered to third. Bus Chamberlain in fourth. Oh, look at this. Now, that, oh. that was a great shot. You can see how high these two are getting. Well, now it comes down to row number six. Is what it comes down to at this point. Who's it going to be? Is it going to be Craig or is it going to be Brooks? Four laps to go. Three well, and a half to go. we got to tell you, that's fighting for first now, folks, because Coda yeah. Jarvey has uh, long since departed the premises. He's back in third and fading fast. And keep in mind those manufacturer points here between Yamaha and Kawasaki. Half a lap to go. They fly through that classic arch at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Okay, let's see whose line ends up being the right line down at the base here because this is going to be the race right here. All right, Craig usually goes out to the berm. Not this. Oh, it's, oh look at that. Oh, nice they, move. Oh, they flip-flop that time, did yeah, they not? Yeah. yeah, but you know, that's a mental thing because what, what Craig does there is he forces Larry Brooks to change his line and maybe he changed his mind. And and for that moment of hesitation. Oh, and Brooks is on. Oh, no, Marty. He goes tail over tea kettle. He is up, but he is wobbly. He looks like a prize fighter that just took the right jab to send him down. And, and Mike Craig looks oh, back. Craig knows exactly what happened. He looked over his shoulders. Marty, that was unbelievable. He needed those inches, those inches so desperately that he took the ultimate dive that time. Oh, my goodness. We talked about the mind games yeah. that are played in, the, in sports. Maybe, just maybe, that was part of it right there. Marty, he's trying to get back on that bike. He is wobbly, but he's trying to get back on. He may, he's trying to finish because he, he has to get across the line just to, to get, get the points and to make it to the main. Oh, and listen to this crowd. Listen to the crowd come to life. This is incredible. Marty, this is a memory that will live in my mind as long as I think of the Mickey Thompson off-road championship crowd. Look at the, 90 look degree at the heat. Play. 90 degree heat. He's got to get it up over that hill. Oh, no, I don't know. I don't know if you can get some help on that either. He... I don't know what the, the rules committee uh, will say there, but... He's hurting, Marty. Look at him grabbing oh. his ribs. What a, what a heroic effort by Larry Brooks. Unbelievable. All right, let's take a look and see what happens to uh, Larry Brooks. Now, he, this was his normal race line up on the top end of the peristyles. He would go to the berm, but he comes out just a little bit too wide. Look at it here. The, the, right, the front tire is sliding. It's pushing on him, and he catches the safety barrier there. And look at this right off of the edge. And he hits hard on his right ribs, and it looks as though he had the wind knocked out of him momentarily, but he doesn't get give up. Standing next to a 1906 Renault, it would be hard to imagine a car built this way could race at all, let alone in a stadium off-road event. Say, for example, sport utility class, or as it used to be called, the ultra stocks? Well, obviously the car wouldn't survive, but they have come up with models that do survive. Larry Knoll, in particular, has given us over a dozen thrills in his racing career. Let's go back to 1990 and the Rose Bowl. That's the battle for third with Christopher Neal in front of Tim Lewis. But it's been kind of a walkaway win right now, a walkaway lead for Vincent Javelin. Although you know, he's, he's obviously driving a little more conservative with only a couple of laps to go, and it has allowed Larry Knoll to close the gap just a little bit, but he, he's still got a, a wide enough margin that uh, he'll be okay. There is the Corvette with uh, looks like a flat right front tire. That's, that's Joey Moore, and uh, he's uh, he runs the only six-cylinder car in this entire race. One lap to go now. Joey Moore in the Corvette. All the others are four cylinders, but he runs the Chevy V6 in that Corvette. So Vincent Jamalon, he's got the white flag behind him now, and a half a lap to go, and look at this. Larry Knowles. Larry Knowles. Try, he's trying to put some pressure on him. Oh, my goodness, this could be a problem. Watch Knowles. Watch Knowles. He went around the problem, and Larry Knowles 
you wonder why he's got the lead on the Mickey Thompson circuit. Well, we talk about lap traffic playing a factor, and here it is. The winner, Larry Noel, and take a look at Vince Shomlin. That's where he's going to finish this race. Oh, he's all piggybacked right now. Unbelievable. I think that's Jim Smith that he's on top of. But open the door and let, uh, and let Larry Noel walk on in. A decade of racing continues now from Indianapolis. This is a handbrake. A lot of people don't realize it, but when auto racing first began many, many years ago, this is how they stopped the car, with an actual handbrake. A handbrake has helped a fellow that we've come to know and like a lot on the Mickey Thompson circuit. His name is Joe Price. Uh, a few years back, Joe lost the use of his legs. But would that make him quit racing? No way. As you watch the Superlights competing at each event, there is one man who has not been to Victory Lane lately, but still stands above his competition. You see, back in 1981, Joe Price was paralyzed from the waist down in a motocross accident. Now, at age 45, Price is competing in his third year on the Mickey Thompson circuit, driving a Superlight. Joe, I, I think the first question most non-racers ask racers is why they do it, but especially in your case, after having a serious accident on a motorcycle, why get back into racing? Uh, it's just uh, the adrenaline of racing and uh, gives me something to do. Otherwise, I'd just be kind of laying around on weekends, so it's a, it's a lot more fun. What were the specific obstacles that you had to overcome? Uh, really, I didn't have any. Everybody here helps me out. Uh, they keep an eye out for me on the track, you know, if I break down, but they always pull you in, so it was a pretty easy move. The design of uh, these vehicles is set up well with all the hand control. Yeah, Honda makes uh, all their Odyssey hand controls, so they all come that way, so it was no problem converting it. Joe, when you're out there, uh, does anybody cut you any slack? No, no, not at all. <laughs> Do you wish so somebody would cut you some slack? <laughs> yeah, that might help out. <laughs> no, it's uh, no slack whatsoever. Everybody's racing hard and is going for it. Joe Price is not worried about winning races nor making any kind of statement. He just wants to have fun. And when he puts on his helmet and climbs behind his superlight, he knows that he's competing on an equal basis with everyone else on the track. It puts me on an equal, equal ground with everybody, and uh, it's just a, it's a lot of fun, and it gives me a lot more momentum and uh, mobility. The Mickey Thompson organization not only puts on a great show, they also use the popularity of their drivers and their sport to support good causes. In 1990, the Rose Bowl was the opportunity for local kids to just say no to drugs. We're going to give you a little demonstration out here in a couple minutes of uh, what we do for the racing series out here. And there's, there's one thing that we cannot do. There cannot absolutely be any drugs involved in any type of racing because your mind and your physical motions have to be so sharp, there's no room for any of that kind of trash at all. So these people out here are all drug-free athletes that really contribute. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Uh, like Danny says, we're going to bring our trucks out and do a little demonstration with uh, our Toyota truck. We're going to have some other race cars out here. And I'll agree with Danny that there's no way the drivers, the mechanics, the engineer, any of our team could operate on drugs. You just couldn't do it. The concentration level is so high. And all I can say is just, just please say no. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. to welcome everybody here today. You guys look like you're having a great time. And uh, we're going to go out there and show you what it's all about on the racetrack. And just remember, there's no way you can do any kind of sport when you're on drugs. So get high on sports, not on drugs, and say no. Jim Rathman's number four, Watson. What was it, 1960 he won this, the Indianapolis 500? In this very car? Front engine. Uh, technology then. Boy, how much has that changed over the years? Now all the engines in these Indy cars are in the back. Absolutely. You know, and when you look at Super 1600 competition on the Mickey Thompson Tour, technology has always been rear engine technology. And it's been one of our most exciting classes over the years. Fields sometimes as high as 40 cars where we'd have to split them into two heats of 20, and even that was getting it awfully crowded. Take a look at some of the most exciting action that we've had in Super 1600. 
That's the leader, Bob Gordon. In front of him is number 37, Don Colt. Now, he's at the last of all the last traffic, and they're going to have to work their way around him. These guys are pretty good when they're way back like that. They'll let the leaders come on through. They'll step aside and let them do what they got to do. All three of them went the inside that time, so they're going to come out this way. Colt is going to cause a little bit of problems here. He's right in the thick of it right now. Oh, but he does the right thing. He gets out of the way to the far side of the track, allows Archiero and Munster to come through. Two laps to go, Marty. The Super 16. This is the main event, the opening stop on the 10 City Tour of the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Championship Grand Prix. We're going to go to Seattle. We'll be in Dallas. We'll be in San Francisco. We'll be in Denver. Hopefully, we're coming to a city near you. Some of the greatest racing on earth. We hope you get a chance to watch it in person. I got to tell you, I want Bob Gordon to win this thing because I want to ask him what that problem was. I know, and he is stalling on a lot of these turns. It's when he powers down that he has all kinds of problems. He is praying right now that whatever that fuel problem is, it's going to hold out for another lap and a half. Boy, Mitch Mustard and Frank Archiero still breathing down each other. Just leaning on each other whenever they get a chance. White flag is out. One lap to go. Archiero with one lap. See if he can three feet. But Bob Gordon is way out front. If Gordon has some more fuel problems, he completely stalls out. Or if he cuts it too close to one of the hydro barriers, that's Archiero's only hope right now. And this time, Archiero follows Gordon right through the line. They're working the rhythm section. We call it the whoop de -doos. At that time, Archiero goes into a small stall. Bob Gordon with only now two more left oh, turns. Buster, Buster and Archiero get into each other. They took him out, and that's going to go Danny to Rice. second place. Danny Rice is now in second place. Look at this. Look at this. Bob oh, Gordon oh, completely oh. stalled out. It looks like Rice. Rice is going to win it. He's going to come from nowhere and win it in Anaheim, California. The opening stop on the tour. How do you do? If you didn't see the name Janet Guthrie on the side of the car, the number 51 Texaco star could be driven by just about anybody. But of course, what makes this vehicle significant is that Janet was the first woman ever to compete at the Indianapolis 500 back in 1977. Of course, since then, Lynn St. James has driven twice. But on the Mickey Thompson Stadium Off-Road Series, women have been commonplace. In fact, Mercedes Gonzalez made history in 1991 at Phoenix when she became the first woman to win a heat race. Eight super lights on the course. And the number one plate belongs to Rory Holiday, the defending champion from the Mickey Thompson Tour last year. And Mercedes oh. Gonzalez has stepped into second place. And look at her. She takes it away from Rory Holiday. Rory got a little bit sideways through the mogul section. And Mercedes got the power down straight ahead. And look out, fellas. This could be it. The young lady says, I want it tonight. This could be her night. I tell you, one of my favorite names in all of racing, Mercedes Gonzalez. And she's got the lead here at Sun Devil Stadium in Tempe, Arizona. Mike Chamberlain and Marty Reed and eight super lights on the course right now. Of course, Mercedes Gonzalez had a stellar career as a motocross racer, was the female world champion at one time, decided to get into auto racing, and here she is now. Rory Holiday wants it back. Yeah, Rory has got the bit between his teeth. And his, his, I'm not going to let this happen uh, without a fight. Well, Mercedes continues to lead the way. They'll go into a series on the sweeper here. A couple of left-hand turns and a double jump mixed in just for good measure. Now, that's Jimmy Johnson you saw in the number 17 Nature's Recipe vehicle. He is only 15 years old, running in third place right now. And since coming on the tour, he is starting to make a little name for himself. At 15, he certainly has uh, time on his side. I don't think he's even old, old enough to have, a, to have a driver's license yet, but he's out here racing on the Mickey Thompson circuit. And look at Mercedes hold off Roy. And Jimmy has to spin it out to avoid smacking into the rear end of the number one of Rory Holiday. But look at this backstretch action going on right now. Mercedes Gonzalez holding up Rory Holiday, the defending champion from last year. Stadium Super Lights. They can run you from $15,000 up to $25,000. They're halfway through this. Three laps remaining. Can Mercedes Gonzalez hold off? Defending class champion Rory Holiday. 
You know, Marty, I like the way the Rory Holiday drives a lot, but my heart really is riding a lot with Mercedes. She has come so close so many times, has yet to win a big heat victory, or a main event for that matter, and this could be her first. And look at this, oh! Holiday hung up on the red, white, and blue hydro barrier. Mercedes Gonzalez up front as a smile the size of New York on her face. I don't know if she knows it. Uh, she may not know just how big the lead is. Here's her left-hand turn, and oh, look at this. Uh, son of a gun. The checkered flag is out for Mercedes Gonzalez. She is pounding the steering wheel. She's loving every minute of it. And then here you are, finally, in victory lane. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Marty. You're so right. I mean, I've come so close and had such bad luck, and tonight on that last lap, I'm just going, come on, let it be my night, and I pulled it off. Well, take a look here. This is what you look like, and this is you can something you can remember a long time, your first checkered flag. Yeah, I won't forget that one. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You don't think racing is a young man's game? Here's Rick Mears, four-time Indy 500 winner, and what? He's out of racing in his mid to late 30s. Marty, I'll tell you what, I look at the sport of ultracross, and I look at Jim Hollywood Holly, 30 years old, and he's considered an old man. Oh, especially when you're talking about motorcycles, because, I mean, this is a young man's game. Most of the guys he's competing against are in their teens, early 20s at best. Here he is, still going strong in his 30s, and he has given us dozens and dozens of thrills while still being extremely competitive in ultracross action. In the meantime, Lowell Thompson has managed to open up about a five-bike length lead. Another guy we may want to keep our eye on is running in fourth position, Tyson Bowen out of Sacramento. This guy is electrifying. He's in third place now. Somebody stumbled in front of him. So we've got Tyson Bowen in third place, and Lowell Thompson is the guy that leads the pack right now. And there are 23 others that want a piece of him at this moment. Well, let me tell you also, Jim Holly has moved up to eighth place already and is about to pick off two more. Kyle Lewis is running in second place, but Lowell Thompson is the man of the hour. He's age 20 out of Ontario, California. He's on board a Yamaha. As his oh, Holly, oh, the Holly went down, took a terrible spill, and a, a machine went right over him. There is Jim Holly, and I cannot believe this, that, that this young man at the age of 30 is going to be able to walk back to the pits because take a look at this and and we both thought that he had at least a broken leg because here's what happens he gets airborne he takes it deep and as he comes down it's so slippery right there you can see just how slippery it is and then the 39 of phil lawrence and the chad Pedersen bike machine go over jim's legs now take a look at it the, the, the two of them then also go into the hydro barrier they take spills off the high side and holly was carried off he is now walking, and that is a miraculous turn of events. Oh, we got a rider down. In fact, it's Mike Craig. He took a spill. So the lead has changed, and Craig cannot get the uh, bike started, and he's been passed by seven other bikes. He's back in seventh place. Oh, my goodness sakes. He had a tough time kickstart to get it going again. So now Jim Hawley, and Hawley is the leader now, the new leader on the course. He's going to take the lead from Darren Hall. Oh, my goodness sakes. How about that? Jim Hollywood Holly has stepped in and just, uh, you got to believe he earned it. Even though Mike Craig makes the big mistake, Jim Holly is our leader. We move now to the four-wheel ATV class. What's fun about these guys is they provide the crowd with not only great racing, but some of the best finishes we've seen in the last 10 years. Take a look. Here it is, oh. Hamilton, Hamilton, and Shepard went toe-to-toe, tire-to-tire. -to -tire. I couldn't believe it. Shepard almost pulled off the outside pass. Unbelievable, but it is Hamilton that is holding him off right now. Derek Hamilton, 18 years of age, from Laguna Niguel, and he's on board a Suzuki. Again, an outside maneuver. Can he hold it? Ooh, he almost goes over. Unbelievable. Look at him take the double jumps two at a time. Shepard may have the inside line, but uh-uh, Hamilton oh. is going to hold him off. The white flag is out, Marty. We've got one lap to go. It's been a great race in the four-wheel ATVs. This is the main event in Seattle. A big jump coming off the far side. They're going to plant their feet down and try and get into a double turn. Now they work the rhythm section, the whoop-de-doos, whatever you want to call it, and 
look at all. Oh, no. What happened was Charles Shepard tried to cut it too close. Hit his front tire on the red, white, and blue hydro barriers. That's going to open up the door for Derek Hamilton. And what a big win for the youngster from Las Vegas. He takes the checkered flag. Shepard will finish in second place. And my guess is earned enough points here tonight to maintain the point lead on the Mickey Thompson circuit. How about that? Charlie Shepard in front. The Brino right behind him. Back through turns number one. And then coming up on two. It got jammed up a little bit here the first time through. He cuts it inside in the left-hand lane, the split lane. And then back through the rhythm section. Charlie Shepard in front. Keith Sabrino behind him. Shepard trying to stretch out that lead a little bit. Yeah, Charlie, 21 years old from Bakersfield. Uh, he's riding the JP, and that, that machine has really been coming on strong. Gerhard has worked his way up into second place, right up behind Charlie. In fact, he's putting the pressure on on the inside. Looked like he was trying to make a move to cut inside on turn one. And Mark Earhart behind Shepard into the second turn, taking the same way. Oh, Charlie! Up and over Shepard. He hurt his, looked like he hurt his hip. Oh, I have never seen Charlie get that much out of shape. I mean, he's put it up on two wheels, but he has never come over the handlebars like that. And there's the winner. Mark Earhart gets the checkered flag. Coming in behind him, Keith Sabrino. And then in third place, Nicholas Granlin. There's your winner, Mark Earhart. All right, let's take a look, see if we can sort out what happened to Charlie Shepard. He is in the lead machine there. Now, notice how he is back on the back of the bike and it gets nose heavy right here and he is into the hydro barrier and then up and over and he's got nowhere to go and watch how it lands all oh, right all the weight right on his hip My favorite wing of the museum. Behind us, every one of these cars has won an Indianapolis 500. Very strong connection between Indy car racing and Mickey Thompson racing. Well, Tom Sneva's vehicle is sitting right over there, right. and he's raced in the stadium off-road series. Rick Mears, we've talked about. Right. Probably the best shot in the arm came back in 1989. We didn't know it at the time, but a young man by the name of Robbie Gordon in his first stadium race in Grand National Sport Trucks made history. He not only won the two heats, he won the main event as well. Only one other driver has ever done it since. That's Rod Millen. But this is a rookie. He went on to win the championship in 89, and as they say, the rest is history. One of the neat things that happened this this year at our first stop was we were able to salute Rick Mears on his retirement and his contributions not only to Indianapolis but to off-road racing as well. The history of Mickey Thompson goes back to 1979 where a track much like this one here in Anaheim was installed in the LA Coliseum. Rick Mears was the winner of the inaugural Mickey Thompson Stadium off-road event in the LA Coliseum only a few weeks after winning his first Indy 500. He won in both the Baja Bug and the Unlimited Single Seater. Even though Rick is now retired, Mickey Thompson Off-Road Series will always call him one of their own. Well, Marty, when you come here to the old brickyard, this is about the only thing you want to leave with, the Borg Warner Trophy. And you get your likeness placed on the trophy every time that you cross the finish line first. In fact, look at the glasses on Tom Sneva from 1983. And right next to him, Rick Mears. Now, Mears has got his likeness on here four times, but the one thing I noticed that here is the last one, the hairline, just like the rest of us, it seems to be going back. <laughs> We have talked about a lot of great events, a lot of great races, and a lot of great drivers tonight, but I, I think there are two we need to spend a little time on. You mentioned Rick, his brother Roger Mears. Mm. Roger finished off the 93 season with back-to-back -back wins. He had three overall. He is going to be a force to be reckoned with in 1994. And then, of course, we've got our champion, Rod Millen. His teammate, I know his teammate. His uh, teammate is... A guy by the name of Ivan Stewart. The Iron Man. And they share one common bond. They are the only two men to repeat as champions. Ivan did it in 83-84, and of course, Rod did it in 92, and again, this year in 93. But the one thing that you're going to notice out of all the spectacular spills you're about to see, not one driver was seriously injured. 
caught to Alan Yaros, I think, is going to sneak back into... No! Oh, look at this, Phil! That's and he, he has to take. And he ends up right on his wheels, Marty Reed, as they work the rhythm section. And look at Noel oh. climb up on the back of Vincent Jamalon. Maybe Rough Driving's going to want to look at that. And it is Brad Castle that's challenging the Porsche right off the top. Oh. And son of a gun, Brian Collins in that Porsche oh. somehow brought that car back on his <laughs> wheels. And there's the move, but no! Oh, oh my goodness sakes! Just, oh, he's dizzy. He doesn't know where he is. Roger Beers, Jr., and then Senior. Oh, oh, and Senior goes over. He gets tagged from behind. Where does he go? Oh, oh big no. trouble. That is big trouble for Jerry Welchel. Final lap, white flag out. It's a horse race here. Oh, oh, oh my battle. goodness. Chavez with the spin and the tumble. Parts on the track, but the race continues. Oh, and Roger Beers gets hung up in the hydro barrier, and it's a costly mistake for him, and that's going to be brutal for his point chances. Oh, and Ivan Stewart right behind him is up and over He's in the up. hydro barrier. Oh, 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 no. Stick it in there. Oh, oh Huber man. Goes over. Walker is riding up oh. the finish line and finishes fourth. Oh, oh man. And now a big three car pile up and Stewart has his oh. foot ripped off. Stewart. And he's going the wrong way. Oh my goodness, this could be a problem. Watch Noel, watch Noel. He went around the problem. This race, oh, oh he goes big down time. big time. That's the number 66 of Tracy Monterone. And amazingly, nobody runs over him. <laughs> Reed, Ken Brew here, and we're back at Indianapolis with more Mickey Thompson, a decade of racing. Well, so you think the only thing they have here in Indianapolis are Indy cars? Not. <laughs> I love it. NASCAR comes to Indianapolis this coming summer. That's going to be big. August 6th, uh, they had a million ticket oh. requests. They could have filled this place four times over. So it's going to be a tough ticket, uh, even on a scalper's day. But uh, it, it's interesting. You know, NASCAR is known for putting on a great show. And probably one of our best shows was 1990. The, the Silver Bowl. Yeah, yep. Las Vegas, where all the action happens, not only in the casinos, <laughs> but at the Silver Bowl as well. Oh, this time Chavez doesn't wait. Now this could be really interesting. Chavez has the horsepower, and he's on the outside run, and he's going to get the lead down the straightaway. Final lap, white flag out. It's a horse race here. Oh! Goodness! Chavez with the spin and the tumble. They touched wheels as they neither one lifted into turn number one. And the winner is the number 88 of Gilbert Valdez. The loser is that man right there, Frank Chavez. Glenn Harris in third, Jeff Huber in fourth, the Iron Man, Ivan Stewart, way back in fifth. Danny Thompson, whoa! Now, Glenn Harris, boy, he could have T-boned him right there, but he held off a good move uh, on uh, Glenn Harris's part because uh, rough driving certainly would have been taking a look at it, would have probably ended up penalizing both of them, but a sideways maneuver for Danny Thompson. He doesn't look to have the side bite as, as well for this race as he did in heat race number one. The course has dried out. Watch how much spin he is getting to the outside. As they come around turn four, Roger Mears Sr. still up on the railing in a narrow course like this. How big? Oh, Thompson has made a move. Oh, oh, oh no! Danny Thompson and Roger Mears Jr. collide and both of them end up over and that is going to bring out a full course yellow. Then you've got Roger Mears Jr., Don Turk, and the Iron Man. And here we go. White flag out. So you've got your final lap in what has been a really eventful heat number two of the Grand National Sport Truck. Watch the battle between Walker Evans and Jeff Huber. Huber going to try and close the door, but Walker got the inside line, and he's going to try and stick it in there. Oh, Huber goes man. over. They're going to let this finish out because they will not go around again. There will be no full course yellow. And Iron Man, Ivan Stewart, goes to the inside, gets hung up on the hydro barrier just a little bit. That is Jeff Huber over on the side. Glenn Harris is going to win at any race. Look at Walker. Bicycle. Walker is riding across oh. the finish line and finishes fourth. Oh, man. Jeff Elrod currently in third place, but the lead continues to be in the lap of Larry Knoll. Then that's uh, Tim Lewis in the Porsche. Elrod and Christopher Neal. Neal's getting a little ride on the back of uh, Elrod there. And then here on the outside is the 16th of Brad Castle in the Toyota. 
Oh, and he sticks it inside, takes Christopher Neal, and holds the position. Porsche seems to be having a lot of trouble maneuvering the curves where the Porsche seemed to be strong earlier in the heat race. And, and again, that is the tire cut. In other words, they they were not... Look at that. Look at that. They're spinning going down into this. Look at Christopher Neal up on the... Oh, man. There. And he manages to drive through it. That is great. And here comes Smith right back. I mean, these guys are just driving into each other now. Rough driving may want to take a look at all this. Meanwhile, it's still Larry Knoll in the 88 car or truck that is still out in front. Hot on his heels, the number four truck of Tim Lewis. But here is the battle on the race course. There oh. goes a left front wheel off of Jim Smith's car. Or, or pardon me, not Jim Brad Smith's Castle. car. Brad Castle's car. And there's also one off of Christopher Neal's car. So all that banging got neither one of them much benefit, except that Castle's going to try and drive through. Indianapolis, that is synonymous with the 500. It is without a doubt A.J. Foyt. In fact, there's a whole section of the museum here dedicated to his four victories. We can't even show it all to you because it's so huge. All four race-winning cars are here. In the Mickey Thompson tour, Ken, our top guy is probably Ivan Stewart. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that, Marty. I mean, 17 Grand National Sport Truck wins. He is the man in Mickey Thompson Stadium off-road racing. But more importantly about Ivan Stewart is the kind of person he is. On the track, off the track, a great guy. But on the track, you better not get in his way, because Ivan Stewart's liable to run you over. Rick Johnson will have the white flag in his face now. And after three restarts... Oh, and Rod Millen gets punted by his own teammate. Ivan Stewart takes Rod Millen out. Let's go back and take a look. Watch the left side of the screen. There's the number one of Rod Millen. He comes in. He stalls. Oh, and Ivan coming in hard. Just miscalculates his own teammate making a move, and he sends him over. Well, if you think it's a young man's sport, you might think again. Roger Mears is sporting from Bakersfield. Oh, Ivan Stewart goes up, and Roger Mears Jr. has nowhere to go but underneath him. And they are hung up together, and this will certainly bring out a yellow flag situation. Ivan is pushing that Toyota pickup truck to its maximum limits right now. So is Roger Mears Sr. Look at him. Mears is trying to set him up on the inside, but I think Ivan's going to drive a very wide Toyota these last couple of corners. Two more left-hand turns, and ladies and gentlemen, you are seeing history in the making. This is the only race that has ever gotten away from Ivan, and the Ironman wins it, and San Diego finally takes the checkered flag in his very own backyard. Now take a look. Ivan gets right in to Mears at this point, and Mears almost loses it, does end up losing the position. Then as it continues down into turn one, watch what happens as Mears turns in, hooks with Ivan and goes over. Then out of frame, Ivan gets loose. There you see him hung out to dry. Now, this is an area where most people won't believe the statistics, but you don't have a normal diet when it comes to this. I mean, <laughs> bring us up to date. <laughs> well, as you know, Marty, I like... You know, I'm a big eater. I'm, I, everything I do is in a big way, and I enjoy eating. So, so I try and keep my uh, uh, my weight down, but I have to work at it. I ride my life cycle, and uh, but I like my sweets, and I enjoy eating. Wait, wait. We have to explain here. Big eater. A dozen eggs, a pound of bacon, a quarter of milk, a, a, a gallon of orange juice, and that's just the prelude to breakfast. You, you're exaggerating a little bit now, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> What's important is Walker Evans may come around. You can see the smoke just pouring through the cockpit. Walker Evans may have time to come and pass Ivan Stewart. Oh, boy, this could get this could get pretty interesting. Ivan is just burning up. Smoke everywhere. He's trying to get off the course. He is. He's going to pull over to the side. And here comes Walker. He's going to go right past him as Ivan's climbing out of the car, and there's fire. There's fire in the cockpit of the Toyota. As Ivan putting the heat on, you don't suppose that there has been some team talk on who they want to finish first, do you, Bart? I don't think so. Rod's on a hot streak of his own, but Ivan in front of the hometown folks looks like he's going to do it. Isn't that something? Ivan Stewart has never won a main event here in San Diego. Oh, I don't believe what I just saw. I've seen it all. Oh, my God. Rod Millen takes the win. Ivan Stewart is stuck. He's trying to get going again. Oh, my God. He's not even going to finish third. 
We watched for many years as Ivan fought with another great veteran of this sport, Walker Evans. Matter of fact, here are the two of them in Mortal Kombat that thrilled Mickey Thompson fans whenever they got together. We were back inside with Ivan Stewart. He's got a lot of room to The Packer makes a mistake. He's opened the door for Walker. You know what? I think oh. Ivan Stewart's going to be the benefactor. And Rob McCaffrey, bad luck, has had a left front tire go flat on him. That's what the problem was. Marty, it comes down to the two veterans. 55-year-old Walker Evans. And don't forget the Iron Man chasing him. This is getting exciting. Yep, that's what we talked about at the beginning of the race. There would be one of these two. Rob McCaffrey's got a flat left front tire. That's the problem. Okay, white flag out. Last lap. Evans in the lead. Stewart chasing. Stewart is number one here. Walker Evans has. They work their way around the course. They split the seat. They go inside and outside. It looks as though Walker Evans has a clean shot at this thing. They will come out the exit here in mid-course. I think it's Walker's race. He won it here last year, and he is going to do it again because he's got just enough room here to comfortably get around this corner, and then the horsepower and the Dodge, he's going to take home a victory two years in a row, and again, Ivan Stewart will be denied by Walker Evans. One more left-hand turn for 52-year-old Walker Evans out of Riverside, California. It will go in the record book, and it's a sad story, but runner-up, the bridesmaid again, is Ivan Stewart, but there's a very happy Walker Evans inside. The record book will show he won the second stop in San Diego. Wow, what an hour. I'm out of breath. I can't believe we have that many spills and thrills. Listen, we want to thank the great folks here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Tony George and his staff, for allowing us to come into the museum today and take some pictures. It's a great place. If you're in Indianapolis, please make this a stop. It's open every day but Christmas. Right. We also want to thank all you fans that braved all kinds of elements. We had heat, we had extreme cold, we had extreme wet, but you still came out and supported us, and we appreciate that. And also, we want to thank those of you at home who have taken the time to tune in over the season, and uh, we look forward to doing it again. Marty, I enjoyed it. Same, same here, partner. All right, and for all of us here at ESPN, thanks for watching, and so long, everybody. Mickey Thompson Stadium Off-Road Racing has been brought to you by Budweiser, Beachwood Age for a crisp, clean, classic taste. And by Toyota Motorsports, where technology on a fast track is built into every Toyota. And by Valvoline, people who know use Valvoline.